for invite, inviting me to share uh, with you. Um, I'd like to begin with some words of Thai. Just as a flower is made only of non-flower elements, Buddhism is made only of non-Buddhist is made only of non-Buddhist elements, including Christian ones, and Christianity is made of non-Christian elements, including Buddhist ones. We have different roots, traditions, and ways of seeing, but we share the common qualities of love, understanding, and acceptance. For our dialogue to be open, we need to open our hearts, set aside our prejudices, listen deeply, and represent truthfully what we know and understand. When we are still looking deeply and touching the source of our true wisdom, we touch the living Buddha and the living Christ in ourselves and in each person we meet. And I think <clears throat> this is very important for us as Buddhists and Christians to realize that we can learn from each other. Uh, and sometimes that learning will be uh, useful and sometimes it will be an aid to put away some uh, thoughts that we may have had which are negative. This uh, week, or this past week, because we're in a new week, uh, we had the celebration of all saints on the 1st of November, the celebration of all Souls on the 2nd of November, and Guy Fawkes Night on the 5th. Uh, so I entitled my um, talk as Saints, uh, Souls and Sinners. And I'd like to say something about this. Um, I suppose really a, a bit of a history lesson to begin with. The first saint in, in fact, in the Christian community, the early Christian community, everybody was referred to as a saint. They were all saints with a small s. Um, that was how the community saw itself. Now, one of the things about this way of seeing is that the, because it was the community which was holy, it was important to throw out anybody who disobeyed, who gave a bad name to the community. Um, this is always a question that communities of one sort or another have to uh, deal with. How do you handle those who don't agree with you or who are giving you a bad name? Uh, however, on the other side, there were those who give it a good name. And they become the saints with a capital S. And the first of these was Stephen. And we read about Stephen in the Acts of the Apostles. He was <clears throat> preaching about uh, Jesus and his teaching, uh, was declared to be a heretic by the Jews, who then uh, stoned him to death. Um, we read that Paul was standing by looking after the clothes of those who were throwing the stones. So Stephen was the first martyr, the first person who died supporting the belief in uh, Jesus as being the Messiah, the new one who had come. And he was followed by many other martyrs. And so the earliest saints, people who were called saints and received big capital letters before their names, uh, were martyrs. And from the fourth century, so we're talking quite a, a little time after this, they began to be commemorated. Um, but it wasn't until the eighth century and Pope uh, Gregory III that November the 1st was dedicated to remembering the saints. Um, Ty at one point says <clears throat> he doesn't know how 
uh, saints were decided on. And of course, what we uh, know now is that saints are decided on by a committee of the Roman Catholic Church um, and that they have to show that they can uh, that they had um, performed miracles uh, as well as led good lives. Um, it's one of the problems they had with Mother Teresa is they couldn't actually identify any particular miracles that she had performed. Um, but one has to say that this uh, identifying of saints in this way is only uh, done by the Roman Catholic Church. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, local communities decide who are saints, and they put forward for their own purposes somebody who has lived a good life among them, and the uh, requirements aren't quite as strict. Now, <clears throat> we find uh, that we need somehow to mark the people who really have uh, led good lives, who have acted as an inspiration for us. Um, and this happens in all uh, traditions. Uh, Tay said, I became a monk at the age of 16 in the tradition of Zen, but we also practice Pure Land, uh, Pure Land Buddhism in our temple. Um, it teaches people that if they practice well now, they will be reborn in the Western paradise of the Bodhi Buddha Armida, the land of wondrous joy, and the Buddha Aksopahya, or the heaven of gratitude, or the Buddha Maitreya. Um, within all of our religions, there is this idea that there may be some sort of heaven, but also that there are uh, people whom we wish to um, commemorate. Um, perhaps in uh, Buddhism, it is our hats, those who've overcome all afflictions, the stream enterers, those who've entered the stream that will surely lead them to enlightenment. Uh, in Christianity, Tay says, some people have been declared saints or holy persons. Perhaps they're similar to our hats and stream enterers, but I must confess I don't understand how it is decided who is a saint. Um, but we all make our own list of people who have influenced us and who uh, have led lives that we wish to, would hope to emulate. Well, the Halloween, October the 31st, um, marks the vigil of all saints, and we have practices which originated from Celtic festival, uh, when people lit bonfires and wore costumes to ward off ghosts. And it's also the commemorates the day on which Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg. And the day therefore has two dimensions to it, and this is leading us on uh, to almost the next part. The next part is All Souls. And All Souls doesn't develop really until uh, the church is about 1200 years old. The problem people faced was that uh, they, they needed an opportunity for those who had not lived such good lives uh, to get into this heaven that they believed in. And so what they did was to uh, invent purgatory. And uh, purgatory is a medieval um, concept, an idea of a 
a waiting place for heaven. <clears throat> now, if you've got a waiting place for heaven, how do you ensure that the people in the waiting place get into heaven? I mean, I, can they do any practice within, the, with, within there? Well, one of the things was that, well, we'll pray for them. And of course, the more prayers they get, the, the more chance they have of moving up one from uh, there to in, into the glorious presence of the saints and, and God, the Lord, and all the rest of it. So they developed this festival of all souls in which the dead, the souls of the dead are prayed for. Um, in England and Ireland, during All Souls Day celebrations, poor people could visit houses and uh, the wealthier families would give them pastries which they called soul cakes in exchange for a promise to pray for the souls of the people in the uh, house. And of course we know that rich people would give money to churches and cathedrals so that priests would pray for the souls of the homeowners. The man Martin Luther, whose theses we celebrated on the 31st of October, opposed all of these practices. And the Protestant revolution denied that there was any such place as purgatory, that it was possible to pray for souls, etc. The reaction to the Protestant Revolution was the, by the Roman Catholic Church, was the Council of Trent. We're talking uh, 1545 to 1563. And they pronounced, the saints who reign together with Christ offer up their own prayers to God for men, that it is good and useful suppliantly to invoke them and to have recourse to their prayers and help for attaining benefits from God. Well, <clears throat> uh, this upset the Protestants and the Church of England in 1562 said of purgatory, the Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, worshiping and adoration, as well as images as of relics and also invocation of saints is a fond thing vainly invented and grounded upon no warranty of scripture, but rather repugnant to the word of God. Well, however, uh, the Christian church is not the only place where we have these sorts of differences and arguments. Julian and I, uh, a few years ago, uh, in Lhasa and in one of the uh, Buddhist uh, places, and there were some remarkable tankers, Tibetan tankers, offer for contemplation the eight hot and eight cold hells. And I rather in enjoyed reading the uh, uh, things that went with them. Incompetent doctors stand close to the fires to receive special treatment. They are butchered into cups of meat that are then reassembled and life restored so they can be butchered again. Those who interfere in other people's affairs are dismembered by red hot sores and their tongues pierced with red hot nails. If you grumble about the weather, you will be made to swallow molten iron. Rich food may tempt you but you cannot eat because your mouth has shriveled up. <laughs> so in all cultures, in all religions, we have this 
idea. Now, I'm not quite sure. You see, I think sometimes it's been used by monks and priests as a means of persuading people uh, to behave better. You know, if you don't behave in the way we ask you to, uh, you're going to suffer these torments. Um, and so we invent a hell because there's nothing we can do about what they're up to in this life. So they must have to suffer in the next life. And these rewards and punishments are a ways in which in the past religious leaders have tried to control the behavior of those who listen to them who follow them, who are part of their communities. And what happens to go back to the his, history lesson is that uh, this denial of all these things by the Church of England uh, results in uh, Catholics in this country being persecuted. Um, that they were persecuted since 1570 when the Pope had excommunicated Elizabeth I. Uh, the Spanish Armada, coming a few years later, made matters worse. And to the Tudor state, all Catholics were potential traitors. They were forbidden to hear mass, forced to attend Anglican services, and if they didn't, uh, then they had steep fines. Uh, it was rumoured that James was more warmly disposed to Catholics. That was James VI of Scotland, who becomes James I of England. And he was married to a Catholic, um, Queen Anne of Denmark. And he made sympathetic noises before, uh, before his coronation. And he, he stopped the fines when he was... Uh, started his reign he he stopped the fines on catholics and even appointed um, important catholics to uh, posts and this relaxation led to an increase in the number of visible catholics however the increasing strength of the catholics uh, worried james and he therefore uh, started to pull back a bit and the Catholic um, case was not helped by the fact that uh, there were a couple of plots in 1603 against the, against the Crown. In 1604 he then um, went back on his word and he said I want Catholics uh, to have the same um, punishments as uh, they had had before. As a result of this, we get the gunpowder plot of 1605. And the, uh, as we, we all know that story and the celebration of it and the fact that uh, even on the day when the plot was discovered, uh, bonfires were lit to um, celebrate the fact that these people had been found. And uh, as a result of that, new laws were passed preventing Catholics from uh, practicing law, serving as officers in the army, voting in elections, and all the rest of it. Um, and this went on until the beginning, the early years of the 19th century. So what we have within the Christian uh, church or the Christian societies is this idea that everybody should follow the uh, same belief set, set of beliefs um, as, as the government. And this is not unusual. It's not particular to Christianity. It happens within Buddhist countries. It happens within Hindu countries. It happens within Muslim countries. Um, and this is one of the things that we have to address. This idea that everybody ought to be thinking in a similar way, especially about religious issues. 
The similar way that we ought to be thinking is not about religious issues, of, but is about the whole business of our climate and the world in which we live. I don't know uh, how we can uh, move forward unless we, as Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, and Muslims, are able to agree on the future of our planet. The, the meeting that is going on at present in Glasgow is not going to solve the issue. I think Greta Thunberg is right that actually it's going to be solved by the people on the streets, not the people in the meetings. The people in the meetings have a very short term view because they're politicians, because they have to be elected, because those who have are electing them are going to be disturbed by the uh, restrictions on their consumption that are going to have to be made if we are to save this planet. On the other hand, the people in the streets, the ones who have been uh, protesting, are much more realistic. They don't have anything much, much to lose by a change in circumstances. And perhaps they can be persuaded by a, the spiritual example of Christians and Buddhists who agree that we should simplify our living, that we should live simple lives in a beautiful land. And so the spiritual task that accompanies COP, the COP meeting, is one that needs to be uh, broadcast uh, and lived. In the 70s, uh, Schumacher wrote a book which became very popular, Small is Beautiful. And one of the chapters in that book was entitled Buddhist Economics. And although um, other Buddhist writers since have taken him to task because it didn't go far enough, he wanted more oil um, and various other, other things, this idea that economics might have a spiritual uh, dimension that there might be a spiritual sort of economics is alive, but it's not quite kicking. What is spiritual economics? Well, I would say it is stable state economics. That is, we have to get away from the idea that there can be growth, that we in consumption, that we can go on consuming more and more. We know from a spiritual point of view that consumption does not lead to happiness. Extra consumption does not lead to happiness. That is a false understanding. People buy more and more, they consume more and more, they drink more and more, and it does not make them any happier. So we have, I think, to uh, first of all, look at individual consumption. We have to look at the whole idea of possession. Uh, Francis of Assisi was very much against uh, possession. He said, if you have a building, uh, even a, a psalter, a book of Psalms, and somebody wants to take it off you, you then have to resort to arms to defend it. So I think the important concept is to stop 
the thing is to stop using this word mine. What is mine? I don't really know. The uh, Bible says the Lord, the earth is the Lord's and all that therein is, not mine. It's the Lord's. It's that idea means that we are stewards. And I don't think that that's inappropriate for members of any religious group, faith group. The idea that the earth belongs maybe to us all, but not to individuals, and that we are stewards of it. And if we are stewards, then we have to leave it in a better condition than we found it, not in a worse condition. So the positive thing is not to be looking in fear at what might happen, but looking at how we might improve it so that it is better than we found it. And that's a, that positive attitude uh, can generate and uh, appeal, it can, can, can generate activity and appeal to people who might otherwise be afraid of what there is being predicted as their future. That we can improve things, that we can do things better. We may maintain the health of the ecosystem and the like supports that they provide. That we re extract renewable resources, fish and trees, no faster than it can be regenerated or even increased. Consume non-renewable resources like fossil fuels and minerals no faster than they can be replaced or substituted. Deposit wastes in the environment at no faster rate than they can be safely assimilated. I mean, these are very straightforward ideas, but the implication is that we have to reduce our consumption. We have to live simple lives in a beautiful land. We have to make that land beautiful and more beautiful. And we, when we think of all those things around us that we have, but they are not mine, they are ours. So change that word mine for ours, and you change the whole way in which you look at the world about you. If somebody asks me then, as Jesus said, if they ask you for your coat, give them your cloak as well. Because, and, and Francis of Assisi um, had a similar, uh, approach. Don't be mean with what you've got, even if it means that you suffer. I mean, we give for, uh, happily from the excess. We don't need this. Okay, well, we'll give it away. Uh, we'll take it round to the uh, secondhand shop. We'll um, give it to cancer research or whatever, because we don't need it. But what about the things that we think we do need? Don't we have to, in our meditation, consider what it is we have? And I would suggest a meditation task. Think of all those things that you use and say, can I do without that? Does it have to be mine? What happens if I get rid of those books on my bookshelf? Is my understanding, my wisdom, 
the things that are contained in those books? I don't know. Actually, the fact is that not many people would want them. <laughs> but if they did, I would give them. And so I think we have to ask about all those things that surround us. Do we really need a machine to wash dishes? Because I'm a machine that washes dishes. And I expect you're a machine that washes dishes. But that's just at one uh, extreme level. Once we start sharing, or once we continue sharing, because I believe probably many of you do share, it has an effect. We saw this in the COVID, the height of the COVID uh, lockdown. When people started asking themselves, what does my neighbor need? I mean, we had notes through our door. What do you need? If you need anything, please ask. If you need anything, please ask. But of course, it uh, lasted for a short time. And it's perhaps disappeared, but we in our lives can revive it. We ourselves can still live in that lockdown time when we really worry about how other people are managing, whether it's our family or our immediate neighbors. There's always something we can do to help them improve their lives and live more happily. And that is the challenge for today. How do we help each other to live with less so that the world in which we live can not only survive, but prosper? Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, and we have uh, time for questions and um, I'm going to assume that you're happy as you were before to take questions live. Yes, uh, indeed. I okay. may not be able to answer them, but I'll take yeah, well, them. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> also, I like what Ty always says before questions and answer that a good question doesn't have to be long and neither does a good answer have to be long either. So. But um, I'll try have... and keep them short. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think we, we go to 11 for that and then we'll have a short break and then um, people who would like to stay for Dharma for sharing can, will be put into smaller rooms to do that. Mm -hmm. So I invite anybody who would like to ask Colin a question and all you need to do is wave or put one of those yellow hands up if you prefer that way. And Kesley and I and Anna will keep an eye on the two or three screens that we might need to look at. So your questions are welcome. Sandra Davis would like to ask a question. Yes. I think you, you're unmuted. Well done. Yeah. Um, hello, Colin. Um, I found I found your talk very interesting, and uh, I've written I've written down as many as I could of, of, of some of the points that you made that are, that are so important and could stick in your mind, like um, live with less. You know, just these sort of short sayings that that that, uh, that you said um <clears throat> change mind for hours you know it's um it was so um yeah so thought provoking i don't actually have a question colin but i really enjoyed your talk thank you <laughs> thank you sandra 
Thank you, Sandra. Well, I, I have a bit of a question. Um, and I don't know much about geology and physics, etc. But I read that the Earth uh, always renews itself anyway, that, that there have been extinctions of races or um, beings before, and that the Earth always manages to regenerate. And yet we're talking about extinction of the earth whereas actually it's the extinction of our our, our, way of life. Mm -hmm. our own our own selves and everything else that's going on so i don't know whether you would like to speak about that yes i mean i think this is uh generally accepted that uh, whatever happens the earth is going to continue in one form or another uh, it's human beings who may uh, make their nests so uncomfortable that they cease to be able to live in it. Um, we are, um, just as dinosaurs uh, went human being, there's no reason why Homo sapiens shouldn't uh, disappear if the conditions for our life become impossible, but the conditions uh, will remain for other forms of life. Um, I suppose one of the interesting things is how we think of in terms of the distant future. In the past, people have seen an end to uh, human life. Both Christian and Buddhist have uh, seen a time when things would uh, come to a conclusion, some sort of conclusion, a fruition. Uh, uh, it, it, in the days of uh, Jesus, it, it was that there would, he would return and there would be a kingdom on earth and all violence would stop. And presumably no more people would be born and no more people would die. I'm not quite sure how they thought exactly of it. Um, but we have thought in terms of how uh, a heaven could be created on earth, not a hell. <laughs> um, but we haven't gone very far towards improving the situation in which humans live. Uh, be, well, because we act from selfish reasons. We think of ourselves first, we think of our family second, we think of our nationality third, and we don't necessarily think of interbeing, of all beings, uh, and the necessity of us. I mean, we have to live in community. We, we can't survive on our own. So selfishness leads nowhere. Uh, it is generosity that leads. It is uh, uh, an acceptance of our responsibility for those less fortunate than ourselves, uh, that, we, that we will survive as a community and not as a uh, group of individuals um, who, who make some sort of agreement that is based on well, if you do this, I'll do that. But of generosity of spirit. Does that answer your question, Terry? Hello, Joe. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Yes, uh, thank you so much for a really, um, really beautiful and, and also just very interesting uh, talk. Um, I think I wanted to ask a question just to ask what you can convey from your experience over uh, what I gather will be, be decades as, as a spiritual guide and leader. You know, you, you've talked a lot about quite ancient wisdom that is in the best way, nothing new, something that has been 
preached for millennia and, and about how it remains very relevant today. Um, but it's one of those things where I, I always find myself oscillating between hope and, and despair. And I guess I'm wondering from your experience um, of, of doing your work and practice over, over a fair amount of time, can you share any, any advice as to what you see works in a sense? I, I know that may seem very abstract, but I guess I'm wondering, you know, what practices both personal and, and social really help to establish change and, and progress in the direction we'd all like to see and anything we might, might be mindful of avoiding. Yes, I'm not sure. I, one of the things that um, I have lived through, of course, is that in the uh, 60s and 70s, early 70s, there was, amongst young people, a much greater commitment to an alternative lifestyle, a, a rejection of society's values. But in the late 70s and 80s, this disappeared. And I think it, but I think this may be cyclical. And I think we may now have returned to a point where young people are prepared to uh, take an initiative to move away from the uh, way in which their parents are living. And I think this is a hopeful sign. I, I think all these youngsters who, are uh, gathering or have been gathering in Glasgow to tell the politicians and uh, industrialists and all the others who are gathered there that they want things to happen differently and faster and that it's their future that they're looking at. Now the question will be uh, when they get to the stage in which they have the means and the power to make a difference, whether they will uh, take that up positively, because one of the lessons that seems to happen is, uh, seems, seems to be true, is, is that people become more conservative as they grow older. And when you have a family, you know, if you haven't got children, you don't worry about uh, your family. Uh, once you've got a, a family, then that becomes a focus. Once you've got a family, you've got a house to live in, and that becomes a focus. And so gradually, as you go through life, you accumulate more, and you become less interested in change. So my feeling is that always the hope is in the young, in, in youngsters, and that we who are the older ones, I don't see very many young people on the uh, <laughs> screen at the moment. We who are the older ones have to make sure that the youngsters have the tools, have the support uh, to carry out their um, ideas, to, to, to realize their vision. And so my hope is always that the youngsters will teach us they will show us that what's possible. Does that help, Joe? It does, thank you. And actually it brought to my mind, um, I, was, I was doing some teaching at a university a few days ago and um, was very struck by some of the, uh, the, the principles and ideals being espoused by the students, which I felt were a sign of hope, but also something perhaps that could benefit from cultivation from, from older generations, which I sadly have to put myself into nowadays as well. Um, so maybe there's something about dialogue across generations. Um, thank you. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. Are you waving, Detta? 
<laughs> Not waving, drowning. <laughs> but uh, yes, I. Mean, if I'm given a chance, I would. It's not a question, but some thoughts of sharing. I belong to a Jain tradition. But I was brought up in Egypt. I don't know whether you were aware of Jains, and they always talked about simple life, very, very little possessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I have been listening to this right from my childhood. But when I see people. I feel that they, what they say, they re, do they really practice it? Uh, is it because they don't find it practical, or they just want they just uh, what to say um, satisfy themselves by just thoughts and not putting anything into action, and again justifying? So I think that happens in any religion, perhaps. Yes. It's the short answer Terry wanted. So what could be the way out for this, really? I think the only way out is example. Mm -hmm. Because example is a challenge. We don't have to challenge uh, verbally, as it were by asking people, why are you doing this? But just mm. by getting on with doing it in a different way and hoping that uh, the way we do things will other people, hoping that other people re will realize that there is a better way and that we don't need, that we can still be happy. We can still uh, contribute. We can still live good lives. Uh, with less. True. Thank you. Thank you, Dieta. And uh, we could have one more question if there is one. If there's anybody that would like to ask another question. Yes, Susie. Yeah, it's really helpful talk, um, Colin. Thank you so much, and I agree with everything that you've said, and 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 find it very inspiring. Particularly your answer to the question about young people and how we need to have dialogue with them. But what I'm, I'm I can take on board my own need to change and live a more simple life. But I'm that's hard enough. But I'm aware that there are people who don't hear this message people who are really resistant, and I'm aware that as things get tougher, those people are going to get really cross and angry. They're going to resist uh, anyone who tells them they need to change their life, or change their lifestyle. And I know in me, sometimes I can get angry with those people who don't see the need for change. So I can see some challenges up ahead in relation to this. Do you have any view on that? Well, I think you. I think you are right that un, unless we uh, are able to have a corporate sharing, and uh, you know, at at the level of governments of nations, unless we look up, that's where the lead one lead can come from, is that if we take seriously the idea that uh, we are all in this together, and that we have to respond to the needs of the islanders whose islands are being submerged, uh, that we have to respond to the needs of the um, indigenous people whose forests are being uh, cut down, that they, they have immediate needs. And we, if, if governments, first of all, set an example, that will be one, uh, one way. And if they don't, there is going to be trouble because there are going to be a lot of refugees and we're not going to be able to keep them out. Uh, so Western countries uh, will be flooded with refugees, mainly from Asia and Africa. And uh, there will then be competition for resources and 
it could well lead to violence. However, it's dangerous for us who have a spiritual heritage to represent to go along with that as the only possible path. We still have to uh, promote the nonviolence as a better way of bringing about change. Now, this is a difficult one because nonviolence involves training. And how do we train the young, uh, the people who want change, in acting nonviolently? It comes through example. I think if we look at, if we remember the stand Gandhi took, his witness was able to convert people from violence to nonviolence. So although it's difficult, we have to stand strong in the way in which we respond to these crises and not go along with the crowd who inevitably seek negative ways. Um, just, in, uh, just as we are still putting people into prison who ought not to go to prison. I mean, we still act in very negative ways in our society. And unfortunately, it's our responsibility, even though we are a minority, to speak out and act against this wherever we can. Um, and to find within ourselves the reassurance, the, the energy to live this alternate life. And, and so we get back to, to, to meditation, we get back to looking within ourselves to understand these negative feelings which we have about the way other people are behaving or whatever, and dealing with them. But this is the spiritual task. This is the task. How do I not react in this sort of way when so many other people are doing it? How do I respond without anger to people who are angry with me? because I represent views that they don't agree with. That's the spiritual task. It's the task for Buddhists, it's the task for Christians, it's the task for all of those who have a faith. Colin, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I can almost hear Thai coming through your words, Thai's teachings coming through your words there. Thank yeah. you. That would be great. <laughs> Dear friends, uh, thank you for your presence and thank you so much for uh, joining us, Colin. Um, and I, especially your last comments uh, about meeting violence with nonviolence and training, the tra training interests me. Uh, and I also want to share with everybody in case they don't know that in fact, um, Fap Jung and Fap Lin were at uh, and some another couple of monastics, I don't know who else, probably Sister True Dedication, uh, were, were finally invited to become delegates at the COP26 conference. And they've been invited to lead a session on deep listening. And uh, that seems to me the kind of key that that governments, peoples, everybody needs to be developing more is a is a, um, a desire and a cap capacity to listen to what others want, especially people uh, who are resorting to violence, because it may be that they simply haven't been heard properly. So deep listening, I think she needs to be the next buzzword. We've got mindfulness now, the world and his wife are mindfulness teachers and practitioners and now perhaps we need to uh, encourage uh, the practice of deep listening so uh, thank you everybody and I don't know whether Julia is there but she would at least like to say 
hello and goodbye. <laughs> and uh, if not, no, then no it's know. eleven. It's eleven o'clock. She's making the coffee. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll catch up again, and um, I hope you'll join us again now that you've uh, nominated yourself to be our Christian. Um, and if anybody here knows, I'd like to set up more talks from people of different faiths for these mornings. Um, but of course, there always needs to be a bridge uh, between, uh, there needs to be a link between our practice and, and their faith. So if you do know anybody who is uh, uh, maybe being brought up or practices as in the faith, Islam or others, I, I'm not very good about faiths anyway. I know about Jainism. Um, if you know of anybody who has been brought up or teaches in a different faith who also appreciates uh, Thai's practice, then please uh, send an email, feedback at Plum Village, and uh, that would be really helpful. Because so far I haven't found a Muslim. Uh, I'd like to find a, a Muslim and perhaps a pagan as well. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to invite the bell shortly, just once to finish this session and uh, then we will have a break. Uh, if you're not going to stay for Dharma sharing, then please log off now so that the people, um, dear Kesley and Anna, who are there still, uh, uh, we just can't see them. Uh, they will uh, sort people into breakout rooms for a, a Dharma sharing uh, exercise. Um, but I, before we actually go, we'll come back into the main room after a break and then I can give a few um, guidelines for Dharma sharing in case there are people here who, who haven't practiced that with us yet. So thank you for your presence and your patience. And uh, Colin, please enjoy your coffee and uh, give Julia a big hug from me.